We have been here before. A place of grieving and mourning. We have been here before. A night that seems it won't end. We have been here before. Knee deep in fear, knee deep in doubt. We have been here before. Good Friday, the night Christ died. So once again, we find ourselves here. In community. In God's arms. Where else would we go when the world falls apart? Let us worship Holy God. Holy God. We admit that we struggle with this day. We struggle with Good Friday for three reasons. First, no one likes to see another suffer. On this day, we are face to face with the cross. And your suffering is hard for us to bear. Second, the pain of this day reminds us of the pain of past and present days. And our own pain is hard for us to bear. The third, we are reminded of the suffering we cast onto others. Which means we have to confront the pain we have caused you. So forgive us for skirting around the edges of this day. Forgive us for averting our eyes and avoiding the sinking feeling in our chests. Forgive us for distracting ourselves from the hurt and forgive us for the ways in which we add suffering to the world. We do not like to be here, a place of grief and despair, at the foot of the cross, face to face with state-sanctioned violence. And yet, here is where we are. So forgive us and then use us for your good. Gratefully we pray. Amen. Family of faith, even on this day, even at the foot of the cross, even here, even now, Christ is saying, forgive them. They know not what they do. We often don't feel that we deserve this grace but we receive it nonetheless. Say these words aloud with me and trust that they belong to you. In my best and worst moments, I am a child of God. Nothing can separate me from the truth, not even death. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, Scripture tells us there was a lot of shouting on your crucifixion day. The crowds were yelling, Take him away! Crucify him! This man claims he is king of the Jews. And Mary cried out in grief. And you cried out in pain. It seems there was a lot of shouting. Two thousand years later, and we are still shouting. And the world is still filled with violence. The air feels so full of words, so full of hurt. I imagine you know the feeling. So today we ask that you quiet us in this moment. Quiet our minds. Quiet our insecurities and our distractions. Quiet our fears. Quiet us to hear your voice and speak to us now. We are listening. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 18th chapter. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, 
because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the temple police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of these man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jewish people come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? And again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters, and it was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid the ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. 
So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jewish authorities replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish authorities. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he said this, he went out to the crowd again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the temple police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The crowd answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the crowd cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. 
Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the crowd, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, 
which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Judeans wrote, read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the temple said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what Scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, Jesus knew all was now finished. He said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jewish authorities did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that Scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of Scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the temple authorities, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come at night to Jesus, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. 
Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Again and again, we find ourselves here. We find ourselves watching world-changing events through the window of our personal perspectives. How we experience those events shapes our responses to them. As we are uniquely and wonderfully made, no one human experience and corresponding response is exactly alike. We do have a choice in how we respond to our experiences. We can choose to be passive observers, or we can choose to be active witnesses, willing to testify to the truth with our words and actions. Again and again, we find ourselves at the foot of the cross, called to bear witness to the world what God has done in Jesus Christ. While we are 2,000 years removed from the events of this day, let us listen in on the thoughts of three eyewitnesses who looked upon the cross on the day of Jesus' death. Jesus, what did you do? Why did they come for you with so many Roman soldiers and the temple police? That was some show of force. It was as if the whole world was searching for you. Like me, you're only one man. Why is there so much hostility and violence directed your way? I am one man a slave, mostly invisible to almost everyone. I was there because I had no choice. Your right-hand man tried to defend you and decided to wildly wield a weapon and cut off my ear. There I was, bleeding and in shock. 
I do appreciate that you told him to put his sword away. But what did I do to deserve this? Now, as I see you hanging from that cross, bleeding, mocked, and humiliated by all sorts of men, Jesus, what did you do to deserve this? Jesus, how is it that we are called human beings when we keep doing things like this to each other? Yet, what can I do? I'm sorry, Jesus. I'm just a slave. What can I do about it? Jesus, what did you do? Your own people charged you with treason against the Roman Empire. They say you claim to be a king. Your own people say they have no king except for Caesar. None of this makes any sense. Any man in his right mind who's brought before me on charges such as this would have begged for his life, or at least a quick death, and defended the charges against him. You, Jesus, put up no resistance. When you stood before me, I saw no insurrectionist. I saw no leader of a rebellion. I saw no evidence of treason against the Roman state. But you? You left me no choice. I had to do it. I had to send you to the place where you now hang. Or I myself may have been in your place if there had been an uprising under my watch on account of your freedom. Caesar doesn't look kindly upon governors who are unable to main Roman peace in the region of the empire that they've been entrusted with. You left me no choice. Jesus, forgive me for what I failed to do. I was not in agreement with the high priests and the elders with their charges against you. I believe what you have been teaching. I believe that you have come from God. I believe that you are the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the long-awaited Messiah. Yet, I felt powerless to do anything. Powerless to say anything that would contradict Caiaphas. There may have been a place for me on a cross next to you today if I had tried to stop this preordained plot against you. What choice did I have? I was one of your followers, like Nicodemus, who had to hide my allegiance to you. Lord, I will continue to follow your way to seek the kingdom of God, to share your message of God's love for the world, the whole world. Lord, I will honor you by taking your body and giving it a proper and dignified burial. Lord, give me the courage. Give me the courage to do what I couldn't do when you were alive. Like the cast of characters in the story of the crucifixion, again and again, we find ourselves at the foot of the cross. We find ourselves confronted with life and death, world-changing choices. Are we willing to let go of our fears, anxiety, and apprehension to testify to the truth? Are we willing to proclaim Christ crucified for the sake of the world, the whole world? Are we willing to die to our old self and rise up as a new creation in Christ and to live out our call to love our neighbors, all our neighbors? Are we willing to be witnesses who speak up for justice and stand with the oppressed, even if that means standing with someone who looks, thinks, 
acts or believes differently than we do. Tonight, as we contemplate the meaning of the cross, we find ourselves at a crossroads, praying over the choices we must make, wondering which way we will go. Jesus was crucified on the cross and hung on a tree to testify to the truth. Are we willing to testify to the truth with our lives? Again and again, we find ourselves here. We believe in the long night of the soul, the spaces and times when despair weighs on us like a blanket. We believe those seasons of life are real and that each and every one of us experiences them. We refuse to believe that pain and suffering hold the last word, for we believe in Jesus of Nazareth who was betrayed and bloodied so many years ago, and whose narrative didn't stop there. So while we are here, again, at the foot of the cross, knee-deep in despair, and face-to-face -face with pain, we profess, we believe in the sunrise. We believe in the power of gathering together, whether online or in, per in person in a parking lot. We believe that phone calls and virtual hugs can make a difference. We believe that life is not fair, but is overflowing with love. We believe that we cannot go this path alone. We believe that even here, on this day, God is drawing near. Amen. Dear members of God's family, we pray for the church throughout the world. We pray for all servants 
of the church. We pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. We pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. We pray for those who do not believe in God. We pray for God's creation. We pray for those who serve in public office. We pray for those in any need. And we pray for all afflicted by the coronavirus. Finally, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.